often we have these academic conferences and we study these movements, but we don't have any type of real kind of engagement with the groups and peoples that we're studying. And so, in fact, we find ourselves not in a conference, but in fact a success. This is all a nice <laughs> success in the sense of a conversation that leads to companionship. And I think that's a fuller, richer definition of knowledge than just keeping the object afar. Um, so I am going to uh, speak about uh, this Kira, Kira magazine. Uh, it's a very pretty magazine, and it really has this aesthetically pleasing presentation as well as a rich intellectual content. And I have brought uh, three uh, copies of this uh, Len uh, Venture, this magazine uh, in Arabic, and I'd be happy to let people uh, have a look at it after. This is the name of a, uh, he's asking what is the meaning of Hira in Arabic, and this means uh, the cave where the Prophet Muhammad uh, would go near Mecca uh, to meditate and contemplate and to receive revelation. So this is what the name means, yes, and I'll get into that a little bit. I think it's an appropriate name. Um, first of all, I'd like to begin by reading a little section from an article that appeared in a Moroccan newspaper on October 4, 2006. October 4, 2006. And it's introducing this journal, uh, which began actually in late 2005. And it says that this Hira magazine, this is a cultural journal concerned with natural and social sciences in dialogue with the mysteries of the human soul and the vast horizons of the cosmos through a Quranic lens in view of the harmony between knowledge and faith to stimulate a spirit of knowledge and a desire for research, end quote. So we're dealing with Hira. Heda magazine. Um, it is a Hulen venture in Arabic. And so this raises interesting questions for the global dimension of the Hulen movement. And in one sense, this magazine, I think, just represents the Hulen movement testing the waters, as it were, in the Arab world. There's still a lot that we can tell about this venture because it's very new. And so what I conclude, basically, is that the Gulen movement has launched this magazine um, for the sake of building up an intellectual reserve, kind of sharing its ideas and visions, for the sake of a anticipated institutional presence in the Arab world. And this will be a great challenge for the Gulen movement for many reasons that I will get into. Um, but for one that I'll mention now is that there are many competitors for the hearts and minds of the uh, Muslims in the Arab world. Yes, and so it's a new venture, and so some of my remarks will be very preliminary. Now, what I'll focus on is both the Arab context, right, thinking a little bit about how Arabs might respond to this venture, and in fact, what the needs are in the Arab world, the Arab youth, um, and how the Gulen movement might be, re might be able to respond to that. Um, and then I will get into some of the themes of the magazine. Um, so what I'm talking about here is the Gulen movement's ability to extend itself into a Arab cultural context where the youth especially are looking for a way to have a constructive activism, a constructive activism, without a historical sentimentality, without just, I mean, all, we, all of us have a certain nostalgia for our own historical identities, but um, there's a need, I think, in the Arab world to live between both its cultural authenticity and the modern realities. And so this, this constructive activism without any historical sentimentality, and especially the need for a positive view of modernity, of the world in general, in its current global realities, and in terms of science. <clears throat> so what I'm suggesting then is that this journal is heralding a, um, 
to lend promotion of spiritual activism, a spiritual activism, as opposed to a militant or political activism. It's promoting a, the possibility of a more uh, focused spiritual activism. And at the same time, it's locating itself, but also the Arab world, within global Islam. So it's a quarterly magazine in Arabic, uh, initiated in late 2005. So only eight issues have appeared. Um, it covers a range of topics, cultural, intellectual, historical, uh, educational, uh, literary topics, uh, religious topics, of course. And Petula Gland writes the opening, the lead article, uh, which kind of sets the tone for the issue. Um, and he really focuses on the need for doctors of the heart, doctors of the spirit. He's talking about the engineering of the soul, the need for restoring a balance in the Muslim world uh, in terms of material realities and inner realities. He's really focusing on that issue. This is obviously a theme that, that, that spreads throughout his teaching, but it's now, in this particular context, addressed uh, to the Arab world. So it's looking, it's this cultural journal that's looking at various issues through a strongly psychological and spiritual lens. And as mentioned before, it's named after the caves near Mecca where the prophet meditated and contemplated. And it's addressed to the Arab world. The authors, some of the authors are Turkish, but, but most are Arabs. Most are Arabs and they come from various regions of the Arab world. And they are uh, highly respected scholars. This is what impressed me when I first started looking at this journal that um, these are some of the great scholars of the Arab world, and I mean religious scholars and also some, some lay intellectuals, some leading intellectuals. And so Farid al-Ansari, for example, from Morocco, um, who is a very uh, influential figure in the Moroccan religious context, writes for this journal, this magazine. Um, Hamid Saeed Ramadan Ubuti, a very influential scholar, highly respected scholar, in Syria writes for this. Uh, Taha, uh, Taha, uh, Taha Abdurrahman from Morocco, who is a philosopher who writes in both Arabic and French. He's a kind of a postmodern philosopher in a way. Uh, he writes articles for this. Mohammed Amara from, from Egypt is a well-known uh, modernist scholar. Um, so uh, this is a good sign and is in fact rather remarkable that they've been able to, that this magazine has been able to collect scholars together to kind of uh, represent, as it were, Turkish in the language of the Quran, right? This men movement priding itself on its Anatolian heritage, but now addressing itself in Arabic, the language of the Quran. It has a website too, uh, www.irapmagazine.com, uh, and like the magazine, the website is very aesthetically pleasing. <laughs> so the point of the magazine at this uh, stage is not to dispute with its readers, to convince them by theological debate, which is never conclusive, but to evoke in the readers a sense of heaven, heavenliness, heavenliness at the psychic le level, <coughs> at the level of wijdan, a God-conscious aspiration. As Farid al-Ansari suggested in one of his articles on aesthetics, he says that monotheism exists at the level of emotions and passions, no less than ideas, making sense of the place of art and culture in Islam. And so he concludes in that article that the beauty of humanity is a fundamentally religious question and in no way can be set against revelation. And so we see again with this magazine, it's getting beyond defensiveness. I think this is a critical moment in the Islamic world and the uh, tendency sometimes is defensiveness. This uh, journal is going beyond uh, defensiveness. It's going beyond defensiveness. So what is going on? What is the Dulan movement up to with this new venture? Um, you know, um, perhaps there's been some criticisms or suggestions that the Dulan movement should be more active in the Arab world. Um, it uh, hosted one of the Avant platforms in Cairo, for example, and I believe it does have a study house, at least, 
in Cairo, uh, and I'm not too sure about its institutional presence in the Arabic world, but I believe it's rather minimal. But as I see it, um, we're in this uh, moment of global transition, and you have different Islams, as it were, trying to pos position themselves as the leading global voice uh, in the Muslim world. And I think the Arab context especially is providing a battleground for competing ideologies. Um, my experiences in the Arab world is that there is a, a significant battle going on for the hearts and minds of Muslims. There's Wahhabism, there's Jihadism, uh, there's Tablighism. And my question is, are those representations of Islam helpful for Arab youth, for whom I, in my long association in the Arab world, I have much care uh, and concern and affection for Arab youth. And I'm, so I'm wondering which, which Islam is actually most useful, most helpful. Um, the first two, in my opinion, Wahhabism and Jihadism, are not helpful. They're based on conflict with the outside world. They're not realistic and not very spiritual. And they tend to shun modernity. They tend to ask you to live in a uh, intellectual box. Uh, Tablighism is very different from those two. Tablighism is a, is a worldwide Muslim movement, Tablighi Jamaat, that started in South Asia, that's related to the Deobandi movement. Um, and yet, it, in my opinion, as I've seen it in the Moroccan context, the Tablighi Jamaat is active in the Moroccan context, um, it tends to dismiss um, modern realities. It doesn't tend to engage them. Um, I think it's a rich uh, spiritual tradition, but one that disconnects with historical realities. You know, and then another ideological competitor in the Arab world is Americanism, right? Americanism as a ideology that's trying to push itself into the Arab world. And so you have this competing and rather unhappy moment in the Arab world. And so the question is, what can the Kulen movement offer. And I think I think the Hera magazine is just the herald of offering something more, even a way out of the ideological battle. And in fact, a couple of editorials, Julian mentions this possibility of a, a makhraj, getting out of uh, this crisis. Uh, one cannot speak at this time of, intellect, of actual impact. I don't know how many people are reading this uh, magazine, but rather, again, it's a way of building up an intellectual reserve in Arabic reflecting the religious outlook of the Kulen movement. And so can the idea of Hizmet be more fully introduced into Arabic culture? Um, it will take more than a magazine. An institutional presence working directly with Arab youth will be required. And so Hira has been just a, a preliminary step, an intellectual reserve for a eventual uh, greater Kulen institutional presence in Arab countries. Um, now, why is this important? Why do I think, um, again, you know, I can go and study these movements in the Arab world from a very objective point of view and distance, and yet at the same time, I see the great needs, the great needs of the Arab youth, the great frustrations, the great anger. And so what can, what, what can the Gulen movement offer? And I would say that the Arab youth are hungry. They are hungry for action. They are hungry for a way to channel their energy uh, in a productive way. And so there's this very nice article that caught my attention uh, by Ahmad al-Din Khalil. He's an Iraqi intellectual. He wrote an article called Asira al-Nabawiya Mashru'an Hadariyan. This means the life of the Prophet as a uh, civilizational uh, project, building up something positive. Okay, I think this, this incredible energy that the Arab youth have for action can too, be too easily manipulated and exploited and directed in negative, negative directions as opposed to civilizational. And this article, which is analyzing the life of the prophet in this way as a civilizational project, talks about the life of the prophet as uh, change and production, change and production. And when I speak with Arabs, this is what they want. They feel, and I think it's right, that standing in their way is the state. Right, the authoritarian and the sometimes ideological state. There are other factors, of course, but I think the state is the chief culprit here. Uh, certainly the state is interested, inter interested in stability, 
but the states in the Arab world are often, it's often a heavy-handed stability. There might be some reason for it, but it's a, and so Arab youth, like youth elsewhere, the Arab youth are like all youth, they want a cause to work for, they want a cause to sacrifice for, but the states in the region uh, see, in general, this activist desire of youth as a potential threat, and they therefore work to limit it or stymie it, uh, leaving, leaving these action-hungry youth to more uh, destructive directions. And also, and this is very important, the Arab youth um, have begun to criticize strongly their religious leaders, their religious establishment for this appearance of cooperating with these authoritarian states. Now, of course, these religious establishments in doing this are generally trying to be cautious towards the political sphere in order to protect the religion from state hostility that uh, sometimes religiously based confrontation with the state would beget, right? Uh, these states are interested in regime survival and they can be very violent in their responses to any type of religiously based confrontation. And so I don't think it's right uh, so much to uh, blame these religious leaders for their quietus discourse, but I, I, it's, it's adding, I think, to some of the frustrations of these Arab youth. And the Arab youth that I've talked to, at least some of them, they view the quietest message of the religious establishment as a way to pacify them and, and to keep them from, from acting and seducing, as, as, as they call it. They want to act and seduce in this world, in this world, right? And so the result is a uh, sympathy for more activist forms of Islam. Um, and so which activist Islam is best for them, is best for them, right? Again, usually scholars have to be neutral here, but I think we can ask, what, what religiosities are best for youth today? Um, the particular, oh, already, wow. The particular religiosity of the Gulen movement has a lot to offer. It is, an, it is activist, and it pr promotes the idea of sacrifice, the dark Carlis, right? And so this idea of sacrifice is, is a big idea in the Arab world these days. Do I, I sacrifice by killing myself? Is that the proper sacrifice? What kind of sacrifice is the proper Muslim self-sacrificial activism? Um, and the Gulen movement has already proven itself as a way to generate activist service for the betterment, for the betterment of humanity without needing to confront the state or even reference it. And also, this is very important, the Gulen movement is not a religious hierarchy. It's not a religious establishment in the traditional sense. It's not a tariqah. It recognizes the importance of religious authority, but it does not stand in the way of empowering you for a spiritual-based activism, not for a militant activism or a even political one, but a social one for the benefit of civilization. So I think that Arab youth will respond very positively to this because they have a desire for moral agency amidst moral bankruptcy. They have a desire for moral agency amidst moral bankruptcy. They want a message like this um, for the formation of their soul, for understanding the religious value of the world, and including that, the religious value of modernity and science, how to come to some balance between the desire for cultural authenticity and, um, and the modern world. Um, now, the magazine is not claiming to discuss the latest uh, findings of science, but it's rather trying to offer the Ummah a religious framework for thinking about uh, science and, and, and modern knowledge uh, to bridge the apparent gap between religious thinking and modern thinking. And Taha Abdurrahman, I can't go into it now, but he's written some wonderful articles on the relationship of religion uh, to knowledge. In fact, I'm thinking of translating them into English in order to use them for my classes back in DC. Um, now, another thing, just a couple critiques. Um, there is a certain pride in, in history. Some of the articles on the uh, history of the Muslim world emphasize the Ottoman role. And the Ottoman history is a very fascinating history. And it's one that I enjoy reading about. But how will the Arab youth, uh, or the Arabs in general, look at this presentation, sometimes non-critical presentation of Ottoman <coughs> history? Right? The Ottomans was a great civilization, but it wasn't perfect. History is not perfect, and sometimes the way is not to think of history as perfect, but to perfect history by seeking forgiveness for it. And, and, and Arabs look at Ottoman history different than many Turks do. It's not always a positive thing. And so 
so I think this magazine in, in, in communicating its message has to be very careful about that. Um, and it also has to be a little bit careful. Some of the articles can be a little bit um, uh, anti-Western. Um, and now sometimes you have to do that in the Arab world these days to garner any sympathy. Everyone is doing it, you know. Uh, secular states are doing it, you know. I mean, that's the only way to start your message. Is like, But I don't know if that's really um, consistent with this millennium, and it's not, in my opinion. And, and, and the reality is that it's somehow not doing service. Um, and so I guess this is a critique I would have, that, that in fact, the East and the West, we're all now bound together in, in trying to find a balance between materiality and spirituality. I don't find one or the other to have an edge up on that now. Uh, you see both of them on both sides of the globe. Um, uh, finally, um, yes, thank you, finally, there is a, uh, um, this is a moral vision for society. It's not a political vision. And again, it's avoiding this idea of confrontation. Um, and yet at the same time, I would say that in the Arab world, given the politicized na nature of Islam, there could be some use in, in, in offering articles on the uh, sophisticated tradition of Islamic political thought, especially the idea of rahma, mercy. Mercy has always been an interesting element in Muslim public policy making. You know, to, so have some, have some articles maybe on that are slightly touching. That one has to be very careful when one talks about politics. Um, but also offering maybe some articles on these wonderful examples of what the Zulan movement, other youth, other Muslim youth, what they're doing in, 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 in Central Asia and Philippines. This, this, uh, you know, at the level we're seeing now, we're seeing lots of ideas. But I think um, maybe the magazine could offer some ideas um, not just ideas, but also real concrete examples <coughs> of what Muslim youth are doing in terms of action. And so, so this is um, this is something that that heralds a lot, a lot of possibilities. It represents, in a way, the type of religiosity that must succeed for the so for the sake of global solidarity, for the sake of global <coughs> solidarity that includes Arabs too. So, thank you very much.